Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadikap. Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our Pali Canon and English Study Group, and we're studying the words of the Buddha. We're in Volume 10 of this book series titled, The Words of the Buddha, The Path to Enlightenment, Revealing the Hidden. We're going to be studying chapters 11 through 20 today. And if you've been studying along with us, you might actually have read these chapters before class and or you may read them after class. If this is the first time you're tuning in for this particular class, welcome. I'd like to welcome everybody and anybody who's choosing to learn the teachings of the Buddha today. And if you'd like to read these books, you can always access them at no cost by going to buddhadailywisdom.com. From there, you can either download the book, you can take it and go print it, or you can order a printed copy on Amazon or obtain a printed copy here at the temple. These teachings of the Buddha, they belong to everybody, but yet they belong to nobody. So everybody can get access to them. They're available at no cost. And we're going to be learning these 10 individual chapters today. The way that I share the teachings in this particular program is I have somebody read the chapters and I usually will invite students to read if they're in Zoom or I will just read myself. And then after I read the chapter or somebody reads it, then I will share a bit of teachings on that particular chapter, then open up to any and all questions that you guys might have related to the teachings of the Buddha. And we'll study all 10 chapters. And when I say 10 chapters, it might sound like a lot for you, but a lot of these chapters are just one page or even one paragraph. And you can see the teachings of the Buddha because when you study with the original words of the Buddha, you know what he taught and what he didn't teach. As long as you're unfamiliar with what the Buddha actually taught, Taught, then you won't be able to make your way to this enlightened mental state. So it's important that you study with the original teachings of the Buddha, and this will help you to know what he did teach and what he didn't teach. And then you can use that to learn, reflect, and practice. Reflecting is you're independently verifying his teachings, then you're practicing to transform the mind through your practice. And this is how you accomplish that is by learning with the original teachings of the Buddha. So I'm going to share the individual chapters with all of you guys online so that you guys can see these. And then anybody who would like to read, if you would like to read, just raise your hand electronically. Otherwise, I'll just go ahead and read through. And as I mentioned, after we read a chapter, I will then share some teachings on that chapter and then open up to any and all questions that you guys might have related to that chapter. So this first one, chapter 11, is titled, Five Future Dangers in the way for consideration. Just as a heads up, what this particular chapter is doing is the Buddha is sharing with you five things that can stand in your way of getting to enlightenment. And you're going to see what he's talking about here. So I'll read this and then I'll teach you some more once we're done. Monks, there are these five future dangers in the way of reflecting on which the diligent, dedicated, determined monk, far is gone, ought to live just to attain the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. What five? Take the case of a monk who reflects thus. I am now young, a mere youth, black-haired, and endowed with the beauty of youth, in the prime of life. But there will come a time when old age shall touch this body. And when grown old and overcome by age, it is not easy to attend to the Buddhist teachings, it is not easy to retreat to the forest wilderness. Before that comes to me, unwished for, undesirable, disagreeable, conditioned, comes upon me. Let me in advance arouse the energy for the attainment of the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. Then, when I am in that condition, I will reside at ease even though I am old. 
This is the first future danger to consider, which is enough for a monk to reside diligent, dedicated, determined for the attainment of the unattained. 2. Again, he reflects, I have health and well-being, a good digestion, which is neither too cold nor too heated, but moderate and suitable for striving. But there will come a time when sickness shall touch this body, and sick and ill, it is not easy to attend to the Buddhist teachings. It is not easy to retreat to the forest wilderness. Before that comes to me, unwished for, undesirable, disagreeable condition comes to me, let me in advance arouse energy for the attainment of the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. Then, when I am in that condition, I will reside at ease even though I am sick. This is the second future danger to consider, which is enough for a monk to reside diligent, dedicated, determined for the attainment of the unattained. 3. Again, he reflects, food is now plentiful. There has been a good harvest, and food is easy to get, and it is easy to keep oneself going by gathering. But there will come a time when there is famine, bad harvest and difficulty in getting food, when it will be hard to keep oneself going by gathering, and in a time of famine people will move to where there is plentiful food, and there one will dwell in living conditions that are congested and crowded. It is not easy to attend to the Buddhist teachings. It is not easy to retreat to the forest wilderness. Before that comes to me, unwished for, undesirable, disagreeable condition comes to me, let me in advance arouse energy for the attainment of the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. Then, when I am in that condition, I will reside at ease, even though food is not plentiful. This is the third future danger to consider, which is enough for a monk to reside diligent, dedicated, determined for the attainment of the unattained. 4. Again he reflects, Now men reside in friendly fellowship together, blending like milk and water, without disputes, but viewing each other with eyes of affection. But there will come a time of fear, fear of robbers, and the people of the countryside will mount their vehicles and flee. Fear-stricken men will move away to where there is safety, and there one will dwell in living conditions that are congested and crowded. It is not easy to attend to the Buddhist teachings. It is not easy to retreat to the forest wilderness. Before that comes to me, unwished for, undesirable, disagreeable condition comes to me. Let me in advance arouse energy for the attainment of the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. Then, when I am in that condition, I will reside at ease, even in a time of fear. This is the fourth future danger to consider, which is enough for a monk to reside, diligent, dedicated, determined, for the attainment of the unattained. 5. Moreover, monks, the monk reflects thus, now the community lives in friendly fellowship together, finding comfort in one teaching, but the time will come when the community will be fractured, and when that happens, it is not easy to attend to the Buddhist teachings. It is not easy to retreat to the forest wilderness. Before that comes to me, unwished for, undesirable, disagreeable condition comes to me. Let me in advance arouse energy for the attainment of the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. Then, when I am in that condition, I will reside at ease, even though the community is fractured. This is the fifth future danger to consider, which is enough for a monk to reside, diligent, dedicated, determined, for the attainment of the unattained. Monks, there are these five future dangers in the way to consider which the diligent, dedicated, determined monk, far as gone, ought to live just to attain the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. Okay, so let me help you guys understand what the Buddha is sharing here. He's helping you to understand 
five things that you may have right now that due to impermanence, you're not going to have these things permanently. And when things change, it's going to be a lot harder for you to learn and practice the teachings when you're in that condition. He talks about youthfulness, that we might have a certain amount of youthfulness as we first come in contact with these teachings. Our mind might be a certain amount of sharpness or crispness that allows us to learn, reflect, and practice the teachings. But that's not permanent, that as you age, being unenlightened, your mind will start to deteriorate. If you get to enlightenment, your mind won't actually deteriorate. We think about old age, that getting old means your mind's going to deteriorate. That's what's experienced in the unenlightened state. But by the time you get to enlightenment, your mind is going to stay sharp and crisp. You don't have a degrading of the mind as you are enlightened and even when you age. But if you're unenlightened, which the Buddha is guiding you to get to enlightenment, that if you have this usefulness, this crisp mind, and you don't practice the teachings and train the mind, then as you age and the mind starts to change and become more degraded, then it's going to be very hard for you to actually train your mind and get to the enlightened mental state at that point. So the Buddha is saying, okay, because this is a real danger for you, you should stay diligent, dedicated, and determined to attain the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized, arouse this energy to remain dedicated and determined. Then he gives you this other thing where he talks about health, that one's health or well-being, you might have a certain amount of good health, but that's not permanent. You're going to eventually experience sickness. So while you're healthy, he's saying, okay, attend to the Buddhist teachings, learn the teachings, become diligent, dedicated, and determined to attain the unattained. Then the third thing he talks about here is food is plentiful. So when you have easy access to various resources to provide for food, water, shelter, clothing, medical care, things like this. This is an easier time in your life, but with impermanence, you never know. Those things could change. So rather than just kind of be complacent, the Buddha is saying, arouse this energy to attain the unattained, become dedicated, determined, and diligent. And then he talks about this friendly fellowship. This is like within a certain village or town or population. If there's a certain amount of friendliness and people are living at ease, He's saying, well, that can change, that there can be this fear that arises, this fear of robbers and people fleeing from their homes. And he's saying, okay, when that comes, when that situation occurs, it's going to be a lot harder to learn his teaching. So now that you're residing in this friendly fellowship and you have a place to live that's pretty conducive to your living a certain lifestyle, then that's the good time to learn and practice his teachings. Then he talks about the community, referring to his community of students, that when he was alive, there was one set of teachings that everybody could learn from that one teacher. But then he was saying that this isn't permanent, essentially. He's saying that there's going to come a time when the community fractures. And that's exactly what we saw happen, that during the lifetime of the Buddha, people had a very strong, vibrant community, and lots of people were getting to enlightenment. But after he died, then the community started fracturing. And he's saying, okay, while the community is one, and there's this one set of teachings, this is a great time to learn and practice the teachings. So he's saying, reside diligent, dedicated, and determined to arise this ability to attain the unattained. So in my opinion, there's never a bad time to actually learn and practice the teachings, no matter what age you are when you actually come to the teachings of the Buddha, no matter what your health is or any of these other things, there's never a a bad time to learn the teachings. But what the Buddha is describing is there's this improved time that when things are better situation for you in terms of your youthfulness, your health, that food is plentiful, that there's this friendship in the community when there's just one set of teachings. This is the ideal time to learn and practice. So there's never a bad time to learn, but there's oftentimes an improved opportunity to learn in a situation like this. And he's providing these five things that could potentially stand in the way of you deciding to learn and practice and become diligent. So he's saying, become diligent now. Don't wait around and be complacent because as all these things change, then it will be harder for you to get to enlightenment. Do you guys have any questions on this chapter? You can put it into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or in Zoom, you can raise your hand electronically and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So let's move. Oh, there's Tonka. Tonka has a question. What's your question, Tonka? Or would you like to read? 
You have to unmute yourself. There you go. What's that? I can't. I can't. You can't uh, what? You have to unmute me. It says uh, you have to unmute me. Can oh, you, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You've already unmuted yourself. Oh, my goodness. Okay, sorry. I was thinking I can read the next chapter. Oh, perfect. I'll go ahead and scroll to that one. This will be chapter 12. Thank you for the help. Sure. Do not decline, continue the struggle. Two things, months I have realized to never be complacent with skillful qualities and not to shrink back from the struggle. Without sh shrinking back, months I struggle from thus. Gladly would I have my skin and uh, sinew and bones bitter and my body's flesh and blood dry up. If only I may hold out until I win what may be won by human strength, by human energy, by human striving. It was by diligence that I achieved awakening and by diligence that I won the supreme freedom from bondage, enlightenment. And you two months do not decline the contest, but struggle on saying to yourself, Gladly would I have my skin and sinew and bones wither and my body flesh and blood dry up. If only I may hold out until I win what may be won by human strength, by human energy, by human striving. When you two months in no longer time shall win that goal for which the householders rightly leave home for the homeless life. Even that unmatched goal of righteous living, realizing it for yourself, even in this very life, and having reached it, you shall reside therein. Therefore, I say unto you monks, thus must you train yourself. We will not decline the contest, but will struggle. Okay, thank you, Tonka. So, with the te teachings of the Buddha, they're not easy, but they're also not difficult either. They've been made more difficult over the years as people have changed the teachings over the course of multiple generations. But you can now learn these teachings, the original words of the Buddha, and actually make your way to enlightenment. And it's not going to be easy, but it's not going to be difficult either. So you're going to encounter certain struggles along the way, particularly when you're letting go of certain cravings, desires, attachments. If there's things your mind is holding on to really tightly, it can be really painful as you're letting those things go and it can feel very much like a struggle. In life, in the unenlightened state, there's various struggles and various difficulties that you encounter. And as you encounter these various struggles and difficulties, what the unenlightened mind will tend to do is tend to run away from these things or turn away and walk away from the struggle and the difficulty. It doesn't want to do the work. So it will tend to run away or, or walk away from the situation. But what the Buddhist teaching you and what I encourage you to do as well is to turn around and walk towards the struggle because if you run away from a struggle it's just going to ensure that that struggle continues over and over and over again because the reason why the mind struggles in the unenlightened state is because it lacks wisdom it lacks wisdom about this particular situation and how to resolve it and if you continue to run away or walk away from a struggle, then you're not able to cultivate the wisdom that you need to overcome that struggle. So that means that struggle is going to just continue over and over and over again. And if you keep running away or walking away from the struggles, you're going to be encountering all kinds of struggles in your life and lack the wisdom of how to overcome them. So if you do what the Buddha is sharing here, in which I recommend as well, which is walk towards the struggle. Don't shrink back from the struggle, but walk towards it and cultivate the wisdom. What it means to walk towards the struggle is you're reading books, you're coming to classes, you're consulting with your teacher privately, you're reaching out to various members of the community in order to get help and support to understand how to resolve any one particular issue. That's how you cultivate wisdom is you walk towards the individuals that you can gain wisdom from. But keep in mind that the ego is sometimes in there trying to inhibit you from being able to walk forward to be able to ask people questions 
and just admit like you don't know something or just admit that you're having a really hard time or admit that you're really having a struggle with your meditation or with understanding the Eightfold Path or understanding dependent origination or the five aggregates or something like this, the five precepts or any of these teachings. So when you're encountering certain struggles in life where things are not smooth and things are not easy, this is just because you lack wisdom. So if you run away from that, then it's just going to keep repeating because you didn't take that opportunity to cultivate the wisdom. So if you reach out and get help, then you can cultivate the wisdom. You can overcome that struggle. And then in the future, whenever you encounter that same situation, you have the wisdom on board that you need to just make wise decisions to overcome whatever you're facing. And it won't feel like a struggle anymore because you've already cultivated the wisdom of how to deal with that particular situation. So the Buddha is saying that he was never complacent in order to get to enlightenment. He never allowed complacency to come into the mind. But this is one of the things that people oftentimes experience on the path to enlightenment. So you might study for a period of time, maybe three months, six months, a year, what have you, and you might step back for a little bit and kind of digest things, let it all settle, kind of build up your meditation practice, maybe put things into practice that you have been learning. And then you might start learning again after you know a month or two or three and you come back and you start learning again. This is normal. Just because you're stepping away from maybe a learning environment doesn't mean that you're complacent. Maybe you're still working on your meditation practice. Maybe you're still reading books. Maybe you're doing other things just to kind of put in practice what it is that you've actually learned so far. This isn't complacency. This is just choosing to step away from a classroom environment, perhaps, in order to put into place the things that you've already learned. So you can continue on your journey where you can kind of come into a learning environment, learn for a period of time, step away, put those things into practice, come back into a learning environment, learn some more, step away. This is normal, but that's not complacency. That's just maybe wisely choosing to consistently and gradually work towards improvement in your life practice. So the Buddha is saying that he would gladly have his skin, sinews, and bones wither and his body's flesh and blood dry up. If only he could hold out until I win what may be won by human strength, human energy, and human striving. What he's talking about here is winning enlightenment. To get to enlightenment, it's like you've won because there's this significant problem that you're dealing with, which is the unenlightened mind and all those pollutions in the mind. And by the time you train your mind and uproot those pollutions and get to enlightenment, you've won. You've won the, the war, right? The war inside your own mind. So you keep working at this gradually, slowly, but surely. So he says he'd rather this body basically deteriorate if he could only just hold out just enough time to be able to get to enlightenment. Well, of course, he got to enlightenment at the age of 35. And then for the next 45 years, until he died at the age of 80, he enjoyed that peaceful and joyful mental state for the rest of his life. He was diligent to get to enlightenment getting to this supreme security from bondage. Because when the mind is unenlightened, it's bound up. It's got all these pollutions and you experience these strong feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy. The mind is very discontent at different times in the unenlightened state. But as you stay diligent and dedicated to awakening to enlightenment and you get free from these strong feelings, you're free from bondage. You've achieved this supreme freedom from your mind being bound up. Because when your mind's bound up and it's polluted, all it takes is somebody to say one little thing that you disagree with or you know, say something about how you look or how you appear, and boom, you're irritated, you're annoyed, you're agitated, you're angry, your mind's bound up. You don't have control or discipline of the mind. But by the time you get to awakening, you have complete freedom from this bondage of the mind being bound up. So he's encouraging his students here to stay dedicated and diligent, not to shrink back from the struggle, that when you're facing those struggles, walk towards it and cultivate wisdom. That's what's going to ultimately lead to the improvement to the condition of the mind in your life. So what questions do you guys have here on this particular chapter, if any at all? You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So we'll move on to the next chapter, which is chapter 13. Tonka, you'd like to read this one as well? Okay, go for it. 
Final knowledge is achieved by gradual training. Moms, I do not say that final knowledge wisdom is achieved all at once. On the contrary, final knowledge is achieved by gradual training, by gradual practice, by gradual progress. And how does there come to be gradual training, gradual practice, gradual progress? Here, one who has confidence in a teacher visits him. When he visits him, he pays respect to him. When he pays respect to him, he gives ear. One who gives ear hears the teachings. Having heard the teachings, he memorizes them. He examines the meaning of the teachings he has memorized. When he examines their meaning, he gains a reflective understanding of those teachings. When he has gained a reflective understanding of those teachings, enthusiasm springs up in him. When enthusiasm has sprung up, he applies his will. Having applied his will, he investigates. Having investigated, he strives. Purposefully stri striving, he realizes with the ultimate truth and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom. All right. Thank you, Tonka. This is an excellent chapter for anyone who's ever heard that the Buddha attained enlightenment instantaneously. And they think that maybe he sat under a tree, he meditated and instantly attained enlightenment. Because you can see here that it's not true, that that's not actually what occurred, that he's teaching just the opposite. But unfortunately, people have come to misunderstandings because they're just maybe not learning the original teachings of the Buddha. And they might think that the Buddha meditated and then instantly got to enlightenment. When in reality, it's this gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress. This final knowledge that he's talking about or this wisdom, this is what it takes to get to enlightenment. When you get to enlightenment, you've now attained final knowledge. What final knowledge is, is that you fully understand the path to enlightenment and you fully implemented it in your life, fully transform the mind. There's no more pollutions whatsoever. All the ignorance or unknowing of true reality is completely eradicated. You're no longer experiencing any discontentedness whatsoever. So the Buddha is saying that he does not say that enlightenment is achieved all at once. On the contrary, it's attained by gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. And as you've learned, you don't believe what you read in these books. You learn, you reflect, and you practice. So when you're learning something like this, it's like, okay, this particular book is telling you that the Buddha is sharing that it's gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress that leads to enlightenment in this wisdom. Well, once you learn that, then you start reflecting on it to independently verify it. Think about anything you've ever done in life, whether it's learning to read and write English, whether it's some skill or ability you have, a job or occupation that you have, or anything else. Did you learn that through gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress? Or did you instantaneously learn how to speak English? Or did you instantaneously learn that particular skill or job that you have that you now perform as a livelihood or as an occupation? Well, there you can reflect on that. And you can see everything that you've ever learned in life has been gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. And that's the same thing with the path to enlightenment. It's going to be the same way. So you'll hear, you'll even see books, you'll see even TV programs or documentaries about the life story of the Buddha. You'll even see ordained practitioners that are sometimes saying that the Buddha achieved enlightenment all at once. And typically in these kind of environments, they put a lot of emphasis on meditation. They're meditating for significant amounts of time because they think that it's just meditation that leads to enlightenment. But you need so much more than just meditation to be able to train the mind and get to enlightenment. And that's what the Buddha is sharing with you here is that it's gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress. And then he's giving you guidance of how to achieve that. You know, how does one come to be experiencing gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress? Well, he explains to you that you need to have a teacher. Sometimes people think that they can get to enlightenment without any help of any teachers because the Buddha got to enlightenment without any teachers. But that's why he's a Buddha. A Buddha will get to enlightenment by themselves without the help of any teachers or any guides. They will then dedicate the rest of their life to sharing their independently discovered teachings and countless people will get to enlightenment. And then they will preserve their teachings in such a way that countless more people will get to enlightenment 
after their death. So one of the first things you need in order to get to enlightenment is a actual teacher. And you're going to need to have confidence in that teacher. So the Buddha teaches you in other teachings, and I share some teachings as well, to help you learn how to have confidence in the teacher. Because you would like to find a teacher who is either enlightened or very close to enlightenment. Because if you're going to invest the time, effort, and energy to be able to learn those teachings and make your way to enlightenment, you would like to have some confidence that this teacher is either enlightened or very close to it. So the Buddha teaches you in other discourses to observe the quality of mind of a potential teacher, not in a judgmental way, but as a way of discernment and wise decision making. He talks about that an individual who you would be interested to learn from would have a concentrated mind, a focused mind. He teaches you to look at the individual's practice, that you should be able to see that when somebody's talking about the teachings, that they have wisdom, they have focus and concentration. The Buddha talks about this muddle-mindedness, which is like a mind that is polluted with these pollutions of the fetters, their mind's going to be muddled, where it's going to be very difficult for them to talk about the teachings. They may stumble, they may have a lot of difficulties discussing the teachings or sharing the teachings because they're not yet fully practicing them. So that's one easy way that you can look at somebody's mind is see if they're concentrated or they're clear, they're focused. Look at how they speak and look at their actions. Do they have loving kindness and compassion? Are they practicing right speech and right action? and other teachings like this. In volume one, chapter three, I share about seven or eight questions that you could ask a potential teacher if you're looking for a teacher to be able to build this confidence so that you can then visit this teacher. And the Buddha is using the pronoun him here, but of course you could have a teacher who's a male or a female. Here he's just using the pronoun of him, but there's female teachers in the world too that you might decide to look to and learn from and you would like to have confidence in those teachers whether they're male or female and by spending some time with them asking them questions getting to know the quality of their mind it can help you to be able to see whether or not somebody's either enlightened or close to it and when you visit a teacher you would like to pay respect to them because any teacher who's teaching in the way that the buddha taught wouldn't have any expectations of their students. They wouldn't be asking for any money. They wouldn't have a price to pay in order to learn from that particular person. So if this individual is choosing to share teachings with you with no expectations and without any compensation or benefit to them, that is somebody that you should really respect. So by giving respect, then respect comes to you also. Sometimes what we're taught in various cultures is to hold back and you don't respect other people until they respect you or you don't love other people until they love you first perhaps. But if everybody did this in the world, nobody would be respecting anybody. So if you understand the natural law of gamma, that whatever you put out, that's what comes back to you. So if you hold back and you don't respect people, then you're not gonna have any respect coming to you. But instead, if you break through that and you decide to respect all people, not just the teacher, but everybody around you, if you respect everybody and you put out respect and love, kindness, compassion, generosity, and all these other wholesome qualities of mind, then that's what's going to end up coming back to you more and more. So it's wise to respect everybody and anybody, including a teacher particularly somebody who's choosing to share teachings with you to help you improve the condition of your mind in your life without any expectation of anything in return. Upon respecting a teacher, the Buddha says, okay, give ear to that person. What it means is to listen to what they're sharing with you. And whenever you're learning teachings, they should be independently verifiable. So as you give ear, you end up hearing the teachings. And during the lifetime of the Buddha, having heard the teachings, you would need to memorize them because it was an oral tradition. The technology to write things down existed in China, but it didn't exist in the region of the world where the Buddha was. So the language that he spoke, it was just an oral language. It didn't even have a script because they didn't have a reason to write things down. They didn't have the technology to write things down during his lifetime. So it was just an oral tradition. So you would memorize the teachings. And once every two weeks, they would come together and chant his teachings word for word to be able to commit them to memory. Nowadays, you don't have to memorize all the teachings word for word the way that they did during the lifetime of the Buddha. But there are certain teachings that you're going to need to know very closely and know the understanding of these teachings. Things like 
the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts. You're going to need to know the 10 fetters and things like this. And you're going to need to commit them to memory. But we have books and we have videos and podcasts and things like this that can help you refresh your memory over time. But ultimately, you will need to commit those teachings to memory and really understand them very well so that then you can practice them in daily life because you're not going to be able to consult a book in each moment of day-to-day life. So there are certain teachings like that that you're going to need to commit to memory. And after having learned them closely or starting to listen to them anyway, during Lifetime of the Buddha, you would memorize them after you've memorized them or maybe in our lifetime after you've acquired them through books and videos and classes, you start examining them. This is like leading up to the reflection so that learning and reflecting on the teachings as I share, that that through that reflection, you are independently verifying the teachings. You're not believing anything. You're reflecting on them to get this reflective understanding. And then as you start to reflect on and independently verify the teachings, there's this enthusiasm that sometimes springs up in the mind because you're like, oh my goodness, here's the answers. Here's the answers to all the struggles and challenges that I've been experiencing my entire life. And wow, here it is right here in front of me. And you start noticing that the condition of the mind starts improving and you can notice this enthusiasm springs up in the mind. And then you need to apply your will. What this means is to put the teachings into practice. And this is where the real transformation of the mind is occurring. That if you've learned the teachings, you reflect on them to independently verify them. And the Buddha is saying there's some enthusiasm that springs up there. But then you start to practice them. And that's where the real transformation is occurring. And this is where the Buddha says, okay, you continue to investigate the teachings and you continue to strive in order to put those teachings into practice. And by having that striving, then you start to acquire this wisdom. That's what you're ultimately looking to get to is the ultimate wisdom. So I usually say learn, reflect, and practice as kind of a shorthand way of describing this particular discourse and that your gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. But the Buddha is a master of showing this cause and effect, cause and effect, and cause and effect, and how one thing leads to the next, and leads to the next, and leads to the next. So he's giving you all the details here of showing you that. But when you hear me say, learn, reflect, and practice, this is what I'm talking about. And you're doing that through gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress is what you will experience. So do you guys have any questions on this chapter? You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Okay, Tonka, is that to read the next chapter? Do you have a question? Yes, yes. Okay, we'll go on to the next chapter. This is chapter 14. To select the place to live, here monks, a monk lives in some jungle ticket. While he is living there, he is in um, un- unestablished mindfulness does not become established. His unconsent- unconcentrated mind does not become concentrated. His undestroyed things do not come to destruction. He does not attain the unattained supreme security from bondage and enlightenment. And also he nest- uh, the necessities to sustain life that should be obtained by one gone forth, robes, arms, food, resting place, and medical care are hard to come by. That monk should depart from that jungle ticket that very night or that very day. He should not continue living there. Here, monks, a monk lives in some jungle ticket. While he is living there, his unestablished mindfulness does not become established. His unconcentrated mind does not become concentrated. His undestroyed things do not come to destruction. He does not attain the unattained supreme security from bondage and enlightenment. Yet the necessities to sustain life that should be obtained by one gone forth. Robes, arms, food, resting place, and medical care are easy to come by. The monk should consider thus. However, I did not go forth from the home life into homelessness for the sake of robes, 
alms, food, resting place, and medical care, having reflected thus that monk should depart from that jungle thicket, he should not continue living there. Here, monks, a monk lives in some jungle thicket, while he is living there, his unestablished mindfulness becomes established. His unconcentrated mind becomes concentrated. His undestroyed taints come to destruction. He attains the unattained supreme security from bondage, enlightenment. Yet, the necessities to sustain life that should be obtained by one gone forth, robes, arms, food, resting place, and medical care are hard to come by. The monks should consider thus. However, I did not go forth from the home life into homelessness for the sake of robes, alms food, resting place, and medical care. Having reflected thus that monk should continue living in that jungle thicket, he should not depart. Here, monks, a monk lives in some jungle thicket, while he is living there, his unestablished mindfulness becomes established. His unconcentrated mind becomes concentrated. His undestroyed things come to destruction. He attains the unattained supreme security from bondage, enlightenment, and also the necessities to sustain life that should be obtained by one gone forth robes, arms, food, resting place, and medical care are easy to come by. That monk should continue living in that jungle thicket as long as life lasts. He should not depart. In the case of, selected, of selecting a certain village, town, city, country, person, similar discourses were spoken. Okay, thank you, Tonka. So here the Buddha is talking to the monks about how to select a place to live. And even though he's talking to the monks, you can actually use this same guidance in your own life as a household practitioner. Because what he's doing is he's separating your decision into two key areas. The first part that he's talking about is that a place that you live, whether or not it helps you to develop your mind to be able to get to enlightenment. And then the second part that he's talking about is he's talking about whether or not it's easy to obtain the basic necessities to sustain your life. So he's saying here in this first one that if you're living in a place where it's not easy to develop your mind, it's not easy to develop and make your way to enlightenment, and also it's not possible for you to easily obtain the things that you need in order to sustain your life, like food, water, clothing, shelter, and medical care, He's saying you should leave that place that very night in that very day because it's hard for you to develop your mind and it's also challenging for you to acquire the basic necessities that you need to sustain your life. So he's saying essentially leave immediately. Then the second thing that he's talking about here is, okay, someone's having a hard time to develop their mind. They're not able to make their way to enlightenment. They're not able to develop their mind, but the necessities to sustain life are easy to come by. The Buddha is saying, that you should depart that place, that you shouldn't live there. Because the goal of this life isn't to just sustain your life with the basic necessities. So if you are lacking the ability to cultivate your mind and develop the mind, he's saying you should leave that place. It's not a wise place for you to live. Then the third one he's talking about is that you are able to develop the mind, that you are able to make your way closer and closer to enlightenment, and you are developing the mind. And then, the necessities to sustain life are actually more challenging to come by, that you're not able to easily acquire those basic necessities. The Buddha is saying, okay, you can live in that place. You're able to cultivate the mind. So he's showing you this prioritization of developing the mind. So in this situation, he's saying, okay, you're able to develop your mind. It's not as easy to acquire the basic necessities to live life, but the ultimate goal is to develop the mind. So this is a place that you could actually live. But then the ideal place is number four that he's talking about here. He's saying, okay, you're able to develop your mind in order to get to enlightenment and the necessities to sustain life are easy to come by. That when you have that situation, that you're able to develop your mind and it's easy to attain the basic necessities to live life, he's saying 
you can live there for as long as life lasts, and essentially for the end of this life. So for me, Chiang Mai, Thailand is that place. And it's a place where you can develop your mind and it's easy to come by food and shelter, clothing, water, and all those kinds of things. But that's just for me. For each individual person, they're going to find different unique situations and different unique places where they might find that they can develop their mind and also sustain their life with certain basic necessities. So you need to find that place for yourself of where you find it straightforward to cultivate your mind and sustain your life through the basic necessities. Here, the Buddha is talking about a place to live, but he's also speaking similar discourses about a certain village, town, city, country, or person. What he's talking about here is like if you have a life partner, right? If you're living in a situation with a life partner and it's not easy for you to develop your mind, he's saying, okay, you know, if you're not able to develop your mind and it's not easy to come by basic necessities, you should leave. Right? He's giving you this guidance, but what you choose to do is up to you. But if you find a situation where you're in a partnership with an individual and it's easy to develop your mind, you have the ability to do that, and you're finding it straightforward to be able to get the basic necessities to sustain life, he's saying, okay, stay with that individual. Right, That's the life partnership that you're creating. So this is very wise guidance to live by because oftentimes people are looking for where do I live? Where should I live? How do I know that where I live is an ideal place to live? Well, the Buddha is providing you that guidance here. So let me know what questions you guys have here. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So I'll move to the next chapter. This one is chapter 15. With the elimination of excitement comes the complete destruction of discontentedness. Puna. There are forms recognizable by the eye that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tempting. If a monk does not seek excitement in them, does not welcome them, and does not remain holding to them, excitement is eliminated in him. With the elimination of excitement, Puna, there is the elimination of discontentedness, I say. There are, Puna, sounds recognizable by the ear, odors recognizable by the nose, Flavor is recognizable by the tongue. Physical objects recognizable by the body. Mental objects recognizable by the mind that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tempting. If a monk does not seek excitement in them, does not welcome them, and does not remain holding to them, excitement is eliminated in him. With the elimination of excitement, puna, there is the elimination of discontentedness, I say. So the ultimate goal to get to enlightenment is to eliminate discontentedness, those conditioned pleasant feelings, conditioned painful feelings, and those neither painful nor pleasant feelings, where the mind's going up and down, up and down as an unenlightened mind. Well, here, sometimes when people see the Buddha talking about the elimination of excitement, they're like, hold on a second. Why would I ever be interested to get to enlightenment if I'm eliminating excitement? Well, what we're talking about are conditioned pleasant feelings, where in the unenlightened state, you can only be happy. You can only be excited. You can only be thrilled if these particular things are happening. If this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens, then I will be happy. And then since those conditions aren't permanent, your mind's going to end up in the painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, and others. So what you're looking to do is rewire the mind, train it to not have these conditioned feelings where you can move beyond this, where your mind can reside peaceful and joyful regardless. So conditions might be if it's sunny outside, you'll be happy. If your bank account is this balance, you'll be happy. If your friends or family do this, that, or the other thing, you'll be happy or excited. These are all conditioned feelings that you're forming. And when those conditions change, when your bank account goes down, when it's raining, when your friends and family aren't doing what you want them to do, then you'll be angry or frustrated or irritated. So you're looking to eliminate conditioned pleasant feelings. That's what the Buddha is talking about here when he says excitement is eliminated in him. He's talking about these conditioned pleasant feelings. And by eliminating the conditioned pleasant feelings, then you won't experience the painful ones either. Because as long as your mind has craving and your cravings get fulfilled and you get excited or you get those conditioned pleasant feelings, as soon as those conditions change, 
your mind's going to end up in the painful feelings. It's only a matter of time. So you need to understand this discontentedness and restraining the mind from experiencing those conditioned pleasant feelings so that therefore you won't experience the conditioned painful feelings. You can get to this unconditioned joy or this unconditioned happiness where the mind can just always be happy and joyful without any conditions being met. And that's the ultimate goal of the path to enlightenment is to maintain your peacefulness and joy permanently. And you do that by retraining the mind, not allowing it to get these conditioned feelings. Because as long as the mind keeps getting these conditioned feelings, it keeps staying wired that way. So you're trying to break that and you're trying to get over here where all of that's gone and your mind can just have this brightness and radiance and joy that it's always happy and always joyful. Any questions on this particular chapter? Okay, Tonka. Uh, I have an interesting situation. For example, uh, uh, I received a gift uh, from someone for my daughter. And this morning I was imagining how I'm going to give, give it to her. And then it crossed my mind how it is practicing generosity. Like she, she gave me that gift for my daughter. So that's her practicing generosity. Then I'm going to give it to my daughter. And, but then the pleasant feelings. I felt I, I felt them in my body, so I wasn't sure if it was conditional feeling that I should cut off, or it was just part of um, practicing generosity. So it wasn't very clear uh, if it was it was conditional because I was thinking about giving her that, those earrings, and the nice feeling came like, yeah, this is practicing generosity. It feels good. But I'm not sure if it's a condition that I should cut off or not. Yeah, when you're noticing those bodily sensations, it hasn't become a feeling yet. This is the four foundations of mindfulness that you and I were talking about in the Facebook group, that there's the bodily sensations, then there's the feeling, then there's the condition of the mind, and then the mental object. So if you're noticing the bodily sensations, that's excellent. And you would like to cut it off and let it go there. If you're just experiencing unconditioned joy, there won't be bodily sensations associated with that. The mind will just be joyful all the time. So when you're noticing like that tingling sensation, perhaps, I don't know exactly the sensation that you experienced, but I remember I used to get like tingling across the shoulders, the back of the neck, maybe in the head, maybe even in the chest a little bit. You'd feel this tingling, like kind of like, uh, I forget what we used to call them, uh, warm fuzzies. We used to call them warm fuzzies, right? Yeah, warm, warm feeling. I felt yeah. warm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the bodily sensations associated with a conditioned pleasant feeling that's about to arise. And it hasn't become a feeling yet. It's just a bodily sensation. And that's where you'd like to cut that off. Because if you cut that off, then you can get to the unconditioned joy. Whereas if you allow the mind to keep getting those conditioned pleasant feelings, when the condition changes, you're going to experience the sadness. So let's just say you get these warm fuzzies that you're going to give this gift to your daughter. And now say you give it to her and she's like, ah, I don't like those. Those are horrible. Now you're going to feel painful feelings because you allowed your mind to get the pleasant feelings that you're going to give this gift to her. And now she doesn't want it and she's rejecting it. And you can't control what she does. All you can do is control your own mind. So when you see those conditioned pleasant feelings that are starting to arise and you're noticing them just as a bodily sensation, cut them off there and don't allow the mind to experience that. Sometimes it will become a feeling because you didn't catch it soon enough, but you can cut it off there as a feeling as well. And then if you don't catch it there, then it's going to be that condition of the mind where now you're going to have this kind of general condition of happiness and pleasantness for a couple of hours or a couple of days because you know you're about to give this gift to your daughter. And then the mental object that this is feeding is central desire. That's the deeply rooted container that all of this stuff is feeding. And now your central desires becoming more and more firmly rooted in the mind. And you're trying to rewire this whole process where this doesn't occur. But it takes time, of course. So just the fact that you're recognizing those bodily sensations associated with pleasant feelings, which are oftentimes the more challenging ones to notice, 
the painful feelings, the bodily sensations associated with the painful feelings are typically a lot easier to notice, but the pleasant ones typically are more challenging for the untrained mind to notice. So it sounds like you're getting a certain amount of mindfulness or awareness of mind to be able to notice those. So now you just need to restrain the mind and cut it off because the fact that you are getting the bodily sensation says that it is a conditioned feeling that there's a craving there because if it was unconditioned joy, the mind would just experience joy. It would just always be joyful. It wouldn't have the conditional bodily sensations that are arising. Oh, you're mute on again. <laughs> just said uh, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Pleased to help you. Let's see, we have a question coming in from Mayu Lee here on Facebook. During mindfulness meditation, when the mind wanders to the future or the past, even though is for a brief second, is that considered a mental object? So we use this word mental object differently. This is going to be good for Tonka too, because she's been asking questions about this. When we talk about the fetters, we talk about them as mental objects, these deeply rooted containers in the mind. And the fetters are unwholesome mental objects that you need to uproot in order to purify the mind and get those out of the mind. But there's also wholesome mental objects too, like generosity, mindfulness, humbleness, you know, things like this, loving kindness, compassion. These are mental objects too, but they're wholesome ones. But then even though we use mental objects as this deeply rooted container, which is essentially like a mental state that is in the mind, we can also use mental objects in terms of thoughts and things like what you're describing here, that when you're in meditation, you have a thought. We could call that a thought, we could call it thinking, but someone might also refer to that as a mental object because that's what you're actually having. But we use this word mental object in different contexts. Whether we're talking about the 10 fetters, we're using it as mental objects to describe unwholesome mental objects. If we're talking about wholesome mental qualities like generosity, loving kindness, compassion, mindfulness, concentration, we could also call those mental objects, but they're wholesome. But then also we could call a certain thought or a certain thinking. We could call that a mental object too, but it doesn't meet that same definition of a deeply rooted container in the mind. So depending on what context we use this word mental object, it's going to take on a little bit of a slightly different meaning. So the answer to your question is yes, you can consider that a mental object, but not in the same way as like the 10 fetters or any of these wholesome qualities that are mental objects as well. Does that help you as well, Tonka? Yes, it's a great help, teacher David. Okay, good, good. So that's the part I didn't explain to you in Facebook because I was interested in you understanding the unwholesome qualities of mental objects first. Okay, so now we'll move on to chapter 16. This one is titled, The Cause of Discontentedness. And this is essentially very similar to what we just read. So go ahead, Tonka. The Cause of Discontentedness. There are Migayala forms recognizable by, by the eye that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually, enticing, tempting. If a monk seeks excitement, pleasant feelings in them, welcomes them and remains holding to them, excitement arises. When there is excitement, there is craving and desire. When there is craving and desire, there is bondage. Bound by the feather of sensual desire, Magayala, a monk is called one dwelling with a partner. In the case of sounds recognizable by the ear, odors recognizable by the nose, flavors recognizable by the tongue, physical objects recognizable by the body, mental objects recognizable by the mind, the, the discourses are similar to that of form recognizable by the eye. Okay, thank you, Tonka. So this is essentially sharing what we were talking about when we were studying volume nine of the book series, which is the book that we just finished, 
where that particular book really hones in on this fetter or this taint or pollution of sensual desire. When you're learning the foundational teachings of the Buddha and you're learning the four noble truths and you learn about how craving, desire, attachment is what causes discontentedness, that there's this longing and yearning in the mind, the wants and expectations. And if you get what you want, you get pleasant feelings. And if you don't get what you want, you get painful feelings. Well, in the Four Noble Truths, we just talk about it generally and very specifically as craving, desire, attachment. But what this all comes back to is the pollution of the mind called central desire. That's what's really, truly occurring. The Four Noble Truths is giving you like a little window into the unenlightened mind and giving it to you in very short order with four specific phrases. But then as you get deeper and deeper into the teachings of the Buddha, you realize that really what's underneath of all of that is the central desire. This is a mental object. This is a pollution of mind or a taint or a defilement that as long as the mind has this central desire, that it's going to be longing and yearning through the sense spaces. If you see agreeable things, you'll get pleasant feelings. Or if you hear agreeable things, you'll get pleasant feelings. If you smell odors or taste flavors or physical objects come in contact with the body, or if there's a certain mental object that's agreeable to you, the mind due to its craving, desire, attachment, its wants, its expectations, it will get conditioned pleasant feelings. But then it's only a matter of time before those conditions change or you don't get the objects of your affection. And now because of the central desire chasing after these things, now you're going to end up in the painful feelings, the sadness, anger, frustration, and others. So it's this central desire that you're working to eliminate because there's all these different fetters that you need to work on, but this is the one that's really truly causing the discontentedness underneath of it all. It's this pollution of central desire. And then when you don't get your central desires fulfilled, that's when the fetter of ill will will arise. That's the fetter number four, number five. And when this ill will arises, that's where the bitterness, the harshness, the hostility comes out towards other individuals through your intentions, your speech, and your actions. So this one's very similar to the previous chapter. Do you guys have any questions on this chapter? Okay. I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So I'm going to move on to the next one, which is essentially very similar to what we just read, but I'll just go ahead and read it for you guys. And then I don't know if you guys have any questions, but if you do, you're welcome to put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. With the elimination of excitement, there is the elimination of discontentedness. Puna, there are forms recognizable by the eye, sounds recognizable by the ear, odors recognizable by the nose, flavors recognizable by the tongue, physical objects recognizable by the body, mental objects recognizable by the mind that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with central desire, and provocative of craving. If a monk does not experience excitement, pleasant feelings in them, welcome them and remain holding to them, excitement is eliminated in him. With the elimination of excitement, puna, There is the elimination of discontentedness, I say. So this is very similar to the ones that we just read. So let me just see if you guys have any questions on this one, which is chapter 17. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So I'm going to move on to chapter 18, which once again is very similar, but I'll go ahead and read it to you. And then we can focus in on any uh, uniquenesses here. The destruction of excitement. Monks. Attend carefully to forms. Recognize the impermanence of forms as it really is. When a monk attending carefully to forms recognizes the impermanence of forms as it really is, he feels indifferent towards forms. With the destruction of excitement, pleasant feelings, comes the destruction of craving and desire. With the destruction of craving and desire comes the destruction of excitement. With the destruction of excitement, craving and desire, the mind is said to be well liberated. In the case of sounds, odors, flavors, physical objects, and mental objects, the discourses are similar to that of forms. So here what the Buddha is really focusing in on is the impermanent nature of all of these things that the six sense spaces come in contact with. Because with central desire in the mind, the mind's craving permanence. It's wanting things to be permanent. You're wanting permanently agreeable forms to be seen by the eyes. You're wanting permanently agreeable sounds to be heard 
in the ears. You're wanting permanently agreeable odors to come through the nose. You're wanting permanently agreeable flavors to touch the tongue. You're wanting permanently physical objects that are agreeable to you to touch the body and those mental objects as well. So if you understand that these things are all impermanent and it's just not possible for you to get this permanence that the mind is craving for, then it's maybe more straightforward for the mind to then be trained that when you feel your mind longing and yearning towards something, chasing those pleasant feelings, you can understand this is impermanent. Why would I chase this impermanent happiness? This happiness is going to arise, it's going to change, and it's going to fade away. What you're interested in is the permanent joy that you get to in the enlightened mental state. So as long as you allow the mind to chase after this impermanence, then you're not going to get to the permanent joy. So you can restrain the mind and pull it back, not allowing it to keep chasing through these sense bases of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body, and the mind itself. So any questions here? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So let's move to the next one. This is chapter 19. Here the Buddha is going to help you understand the three universal truths. He's going to do this in three different discourses. And we're studying the first two today in this class. And he's helping you to be able to see the impermanent nature of things that you're experiencing through the six sense bases. So this one is titled, The Suitable Way for Attaining Nibbana or Enlightenment first discourse. Monks, I will teach you the way that is suitable for attaining Nibbana or enlightenment. Listen to that and attend closely. I will speak. And what, monks, is the way that is suitable for attaining Nibbana, enlightenment? Here, a monk sees the eye as impermanent. He sees forms as impermanent. He sees eye consciousness as impermanent. He sees eye contact as impermanent. He sees as impermanent whatever feeling arises with eye contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. He sees the ear as impermanent. He sees sounds as impermanent. He sees ear consciousness as impermanent. He sees ear contact as impermanent. He sees as impermanent whatever feeling arises with ear contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. So here he's going to go through all the six sense bases of the nose, the tongue, the body. He's speaking about all these things in the same way. And he's talking about the mind itself. And then ultimately he says, this monks is the way that is suitable for attaining Nibbana or enlightenment. So we've discussed this in other discourses within today's class, but also in the previous book. But let me just help you in case you guys weren't attending then, or maybe this is a bit of a refresher for you. There is what's called the internal sense base. And in this case, we're talking about the eye. Then there's the external sense base, which is the physical form that the eye sees. Then when the mind becomes aware of that, it's called eye consciousness. And these three things together are called eye contact. So when you have the internal sense base of the eye and it sees a physical form, which is the external sense base, and now the mind becomes aware of it, this is the consciousness, the awareness, the eye consciousness. And now these three things, we say eye contact. So the eye is coming contact with a certain form. And the Buddha is reminding you that all these things are impermanent. The eye is impermanent. The physical form is impermanent. The awareness of it in the mind is impermanent. And this contact is impermanent too. And then whatever feeling that you experience as a result of this, whether pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, it is impermanent. And the more clearly you can see that, then you understand that the mind's craving this permanence. And once again, you can restrain the mind, not allow it to chase after this permanent thing that it wants because it's actually impermanent. The mind's got to realize that these things are all impermanent. And the mind's doing this not only through the eye, but it's doing it through the ear, it's doing it through the nose, it's doing it through the tongue, it's doing it through the body, and then the mind itself, where the mind is wanting to have permanently agreeable thoughts and the various things that are in the actual mind. And it's just not possible because of the universal truth of impermanence. So do you guys have any questions on this particular chapter? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So I will move to the very last chapter for today, which is chapter 20, 
which is essentially the exact same thing that we just studied, but the Buddha is sharing discontentedness here. This is the second universal truth. So no need to read this entire chapter because it's exactly the same thing as we just discussed, but he's talking about discontentedness. He's essentially saying that as long as the mind is longing and yearning through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body, and the mind itself, that there's going to be this discontentedness, that it's chasing after this discontentedness. It thinks in the unenlightened state, the mind thinks that it's going towards this fulfillment and this satisfaction, and it's going to get all this pleasure. And it doesn't realize that that pleasure is impermanent. It's temporary. But that's why the mind keeps chasing after it, because it thinks it's going to be permanent. So you chase after more money, a bigger house, a nicer car, more friends, a different job, more clothes. The mind just chases and chases and chases, not realizing that it's just chasing discontentedness. That's all it's doing. So if you start realizing this more and more truth, then you're more motivated, perhaps, to be able to train the mind and train the mind to no longer do this. So do you guys have any questions on this chapter? This is chapter 20 of volume 10. Sumit, go ahead. Uh, so how to differentiate between, like, I understand what is I and what is the form it's seeing, uh, but how to uh, differentiate with this I consciousness? I mean, there is I, there is forms, and of course I know this thing, so, how to see this happening as a, as a discontentedness? Yeah, so what's happening is, as you described, there's the I, which is the internal sense base or the organ, right? The I. Then there's this external sense base, which is the form in this case, since we're talking about the I. Then the mind becoming aware of this, right? This is the I consciousness. And then we call these three things contact. And as long as the mind is having this craving, desire, attachment for permanence, then there's going to be discontentedness experienced in the mind. By the time you get to enlightenment and there's no craving, desire, attachment in the mind, you're still going to have contact through the six sense bases, but there's not going to be any discontentedness because there's no craving. When there's craving, there's longing and yearning. So the mind's going to see this thing is agreeable and this thing is disagreeable. So for example, with the eye, maybe you're walking down the street in your town and you see a mom or dad holding their child's hand and you're like, ah, oh, that's so lovely. Look at them holding hands, walking down the street. That's so wonderful. Maybe that's agreeable to you. So you get these pleasant feelings, but then you turn the corner and you see a parent slap their child across the face. And now if you have craving in your mind, longing and yearning, wanting things to be a certain way, now, when you see that, if that's disagreeable to you, you'll experience anger or frustration or sadness or some other discontent feeling. So whatever you see through the eye in terms of forms, or if you hear sounds or nose experiencing odors, tongue experiencing flavors, body with physical objects, and the mind with mental objects, if there's craving in the mind, then there's going to be discontentedness. And that's what the Buddha is explaining to you here. So... Uh so Buddha is uh, uh, saying that monk sees the I as discontentedness. Uh, so what he's trying to say that, um, mm, is, is he talking about craving here? Yeah. Or we have to just remember this, uh, keep, whenever we see any form like I or forms, then we should always just uh, 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 memorize this as that this is uh, Dukkha, this is Dukkha, this is Dukkha. It, it is a kind of a trick or uh, to remember the dukkha or uh, is about craving. Yes. So remember this chapter is an excerpt. You know, each one of these chapters, there's a reference that goes back to the original source. So the Buddha is talking about things before this and he's talking about things after this. So here he's not literally saying that the I itself is discontentedness or that the physical forms itself are discontentedness. What he was talking about in those previous chapters, where he was talking about how craving is producing discontentedness, then what you come to understand is that if there's craving in the mind, anything that the eye sees and there's craving in the mind, then it's going to produce discontentedness. And this is a good reminder for you that as you're out and about in your life, and let's just use something like something that I think a lot of people might be able to relate to is like, say you have 
a certain craving for sexual contact and you see a beautiful woman or a handsome man and you're like, oh, wow, look at that. And your mind starts chasing after it and you're looking and you're checking the person out and you're looking at the person up and down, left, right and forward. You need to remind yourself, no, this is just going to produce discontentedness. This is just the mind chasing after pleasant feelings. And okay, maybe it sees this person now, but then when that changes, now you see something else and now the mind's going to experience painful feelings. So if you allow the mind to take in this content through any of the six sense spaces and acquire the conditioned pleasant feelings, then that's the temporary happiness that is ultimately going to take the mind up. And then when those conditions change, the mind's going to drop back down. So when you notice that your mind is longing and yearning through these sense spaces, you can remind yourself, these things are impermanent. It's going to produce discontentedness. Now let me restrain the mind and pull it back. And the more and more that you do that, eventually you get to the point where there aren't any cravings in the mind and you won't experience discontentedness. But you're going to need this as a reminder for yourself so that in the moment you can restrain the mind. Yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. So it's not that even though this title of the chapter is the suitable way for attaining Nibbana, it's not that this is all you need, right? This isn't like just read this one chapter and you'll get to enlightenment. These are like you were saying, like this is a reminder for you that when you're out and about in daily life to remind yourself of impermanence, remind yourself of discontentedness, and you're not interested in continuing to allow the mind to long and yearn through these sense bases. So it is not like that we um, reject the um, object or, or develop this kind of a negative uh, perception about uh, life right it's just about uh, uh, not uh, taking one step further from this moment as a sort of craving exactly you're not interested in a negative perspective of life a, an enlightened being is going to have a positive outlook on life it's not a pessimistic view like ah everything is discontent everything is impermanent ah you know i'm gonna go live in a cave you know that's not what you're interested in it's giving you the wisdom to understand that when you see your mind longing and yearning through these sense spaces that what you're chasing after is discontentedness what you're chasing after is impermanent so why keep chasing this impermanence when your ultimate goal should be to get to this permanent mental state of peace and joy so this is wisdom that helps to support your practice so that when you're out and about, you can understand that wherever you see your mind chasing, just remind yourself, it's impermanent, it's gonna produce discontentedness, come over here, mind. It's almost like treating the mind like a third entity or like a wild animal. It's like, get over here, sit down, be still, don't keep chasing after these things. Yeah, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. So there's some questions coming in here on Facebook as well. There's one from Tonka. She's sharing, all experiences I ever had are through six sense spaces. Can anything else be experienced? The answer is no, that's what you experience. Everything that the mind encounters is through the six sense spaces. So if you can train your mind to eliminate these fetters, these pollutions, your mind's purified. You'll experience the brightness and the joy. If the mind is tranquil, the body will be tranquil. Oftentimes there's aches and pains in the body. This is because of what's going on in the mind and a large majority of it. And of course, you know, you can stump your toe, which came from the decisions that the mind made, right? Maybe you forgot to turn on the light or maybe you put a chair in a certain place or maybe you were rushing around the house too quickly. This is all from the mind. The mind is producing everything you're experiencing. So that's why the Buddhist teachings focus you on training the mind because if you train that, then everything's purified and you can get to this peace and this joy because everything you experience in life is coming through the mind. And the way that you experience things in the mind is through the six sense bases. These are the doorways that are letting things into the mind. So if you can train your mind to understand these six sense bases, these doorways, and then you can guard the mind with mindfulness or awareness of mind, you can ultimately completely transform the mind. That's why those four foundations of mindfulness were so important that we were talking about in the Facebook group as well as here in class. Those four foundations of mindfulness are your guard. That's how you ultimately transform the mind. You wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment without that awareness of mind to be guarding the six doorways to discontentedness. 
Ma Yu Li also has some questions here. Is it possible to have internal sense bases to experience external sense bases without contact? The answer is no, you can't. There's an internal sense base and there's an external sense base. And then when the mind becomes aware of it, that's when there's actually contact. And now you're experiencing that thing. So you can have all your five senses closed, like say like your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body. But your mind is that sixth sense space. That's why it's so important to understand this one. So say like in the present moment, you're not taking in any contact through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, or the body. But say in the present moment, you're thinking about something in the past that was either pleasurable or painful. And now in the present moment, you're experiencing pleasure or pain based on that thought from the past. And the same thing can happen for the future. Maybe you're longing, yearning for something pleasurable to happen in the future, or maybe you're fearful of something painful happening in the future. So that means in the present moment, your mind experiencing that mental object through the mind, now you're experiencing this pleasure or pain in the present moment based on something from the past or the future. And this will connect to something Tonka was asking about recently in the Facebook group. This is what we might call trauma that somebody's had a certain experience in the past, maybe they were raped or physically abused, or maybe they got in a car accident and they've had this conditioning of the mind that is now set in and the mind's now clinging to this. And now in the present moment, they're very fearful to ever get in a car, or maybe they're very fearful to get in a relationship with a, another partner because of these things that occurred in the past. And now because of the mind's clinging to that, you can experience the peace and joy in the present moment because the mind's still clinging to these experiences from the past. And what you're doing is you're training your mind to let those things go so that now in the present moment, you can maintain your peace and your joy. And then the same thing about the future. Say you had like planned a vacation three to six months from now and you get so excited about going on this vacation. And now you go to the airport and the flight's canceled or it's delayed. You're gonna be sad, you're gonna be frustrated because you allowed your mind to indulge in this craving. You welcomed these pleasant feelings the way that the Buddha talks about. You welcomed them, you invited them in, you held on to them. This is not what you're interested in doing because as long as you allow the mind to form those conditioned feelings by welcoming them in, inviting them in, now you're inviting also the painful feelings as well. So Mayu Li follows this up. She says, for example, if we quickly see an object, but that object have not yet registered in the mind. So if you see an object and you're aware of it, it's registered in the mind. So you know that that thing is there. You've had the internal sense base, the external sense base, and now you're aware of it. So say your eyes like kind of quickly scan something and everything is a blur and you haven't seen anything at all. All you see is a blur well, you still had contact with that blur, right? There's still contact there. So there's still some kind of contact that is being experienced. But whether or not you allow it to produce discontentedness is a choice that you're making. Based on the wisdom that you have, based on craving, desire, attachment, if you allow craving to continue to persist in the mind, then you're making the choice to become discontent because of your cravings. But if you eliminate your cravings through gaining wisdom and using the tools and techniques that the Buddha teaches you, by eliminating those cravings, desires, attachments, now you've liberated the mind. Even you come in contact with, I don't know, anything you're craving. I don't know what you might be craving. Any of you guys might be craving, but you guys know whether it's a handsome man or a woman, whether it's more money, whether it's a car, a house, new clothes, you're walking in the mall, no matter what you come in contact with, you see it. It's like, oh, wow, okay, I see it, but there's no longing, yearning for it. So the fact that I don't have it, there's no painful feelings at all. So that's what you would ultimately like to get to is where you have complete control and complete discipline of the mind that even though you're coming in contact with these various things, your mind isn't discontent by them whatsoever. But as long as there's craving in the mind, your mind will either get pleasant feelings or painful feelings when there's contact through any of these six sense bases. So you would like to get to the point where you eradicate the central desire. You eradicate that fetter 
the taint, the pollution, you eliminate it from the mind. And now there's still going to be contact, but because there's no craving, there's no central desire, you won't experience discontentedness. All right. Great questions, everyone. Very pleased to share these teachings with you. Next week, we're going to be studying chapters 21 through 30. So you're welcome to read those before class and or after class and then come to class and we'll study them together like this again because you're really getting into the nitty gritty of the teachings of the Buddha here by getting into volume 10. If you've been studying all the way through, you've learned a whole lot of things through the words of the Buddha and it's helping to inform your practice of what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not just an intellectual learning, that you're not just intellectually learning these things. Yeah, you're doing that in these classes, and then you're reflecting on it to independently verify it. But then you practice in daily life when you go out and about in the world. So if you went and lived in a cave for 10 years, you wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment because you're not in the world. You're not walking around with all these temptations. So you can retreat like the Buddha teaches by staying in your house for longer periods of time. You can go to a cave and stay for a period of time, but you ultimately need to reemerge back in the world. And now can you maintain your peace and joy while living in the world? That's what is ultimately going to determine if your mind's enlightened or not. So you can't actually just go hide in a cave somewhere for 10 years and get to enlightenment. When we talk about the Buddha going into the forest for four years where he left his family, for those first two years, he was around different students and different teachers. And then ultimately, he went off in the forest by himself for four years. He still came in contact with people. He was getting food. He was walking down the street. He was acquiring donations to sustain his life. He wasn't like locked away for four years and didn't see anybody whatsoever. That's impossible because he would have needed to acquire food and the various things that he needed in order to sustain his life. So he still came in contact with people. So by you learning these teachings, then reflecting on them to independently verify them and practice them and going out into the world and develop your practice where you can walk in the mall and you can be calm and steady and content and joyful, even though you didn't buy anything. You're just there to just walk down the mall, get some exercise, maybe breathe in some fresh air, who knows what. But if you go to the mall every time thinking you're going to buy something, when you leave, you'll feel sad because you didn't buy anything right? Or if you go to a park and you're expecting it to be sunshine and you go to the park and then it starts raining, you'll be sad when you left the park. So you should have no expectations and just go throughout the world realizing that there's all this impermanence around you. The weather, the people, the different sights and sounds and odors and flavors, physical objects and mental objects, all these things are impermanent and they're going to be constantly changing. And as soon as your mind grabs onto something, wanting that to be permanent, your mind's opening up to discontentedness. So we're going to study chapters 21 through 30 next week, and you can read those before class and or after class by accessing them on our website. Tomorrow in the group learning program, we're going to be in volume one, chapter 11, which is titled Meditation, Developing Your Practice. This is where I'm going to go through all the four styles of meditation that the Buddha teaches in order to train the mind. There's two primary styles that you need in order to train the mind to get to enlightenment. And then there's two specialized meditations that you're only going to need in unique situations, but it's helpful to know about them. So you don't need to learn 100 or 300 different meditations or even 10 or 20 meditations. You only need to learn two primary forms. And then the other two are there in specialized situations in case you need those things. So I'm going to be sharing those with you tomorrow in our group learning program. And then on Wednesday, we're going to be doing meditation together. I'm going to be helping you to learn loving kindness meditation by guiding you in a loving kindness meditation session. So perhaps I'll see you guys next Saturday in the Pali Canon and English study group, or maybe on Sunday or Wednesday in our group learning program. In the meantime, have a very wonderful and lovely rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. 
A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.